Welcome to the Entrepreneur Master Series. I am the real Jason Duncan. We're going to be getting started shortly, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Master Series. Today is September the 20th, 2022, and we've got a great episode for you today on the Entrepreneur Master Series. Let me do some introductions first. I am the real Jason Duncan, and I want to thank you for joining us on this live webinar series called the Entrepreneur Master Series, or EMS for short. I do these as a part of my coaching program as the real Jason Duncan to give back to the entrepreneurial community. And we bring in what this is, is we bring in special experts in different topics related to entrepreneurship on a regular basis to deliver high value content that's practical and tactical, something that you could actually put to use right now, right now as an entrepreneur within the next day or two. And then you're going to see this today. This is going to be something that's going to be very timely for who you are and what you're doing as a business owner. So this masterclass, as I said, happens every couple of weeks. You can register at the uh, therealjasonduncan.com slash EMS. You can see the full slate of all the folks that we're going to be bringing on as guests on the show. We also produce this and uh, release it as a special episode of my podcast, The Root of All Success. So if you are listening to this after the fact on the podcast, thank you for tuning in on the podcast, but also go check this out when you can get involved live and you can be here live with me and the guests when we record this to ask questions and to participate in the chat and to see if, the, you know, get extra dis discounts on things that may be offered during the live webinar. So today's webinar, today's topic is how to access the largest pool of previously unavailable money without signing your life away. So I know all of you as entrepreneurs are interested in getting access to capital, aren't we all? We want to get access to capital. We want to use it for our business. We want to make sure that we have access to it in a way that makes sense. It's easy to get to, that it's easy, easily deployed, and that doesn't 
<laughs> doesn't require us to sign away our our wife and our kids and our dog and our, our our truck and our camper and our boat, everything else. How do we get access to that capital? Well, today's guest is Merrill Chandler. And over 25 years, he's been doing personal and business funding, and he is a pioneer in this space. He's the co-founder of the Lexington Law Firm. He became dissatisfied with the ineffective results of credit repair, decided to do something about it on his own. And he leveraged his extensive knowledge of borrower behavior and profiles a FICO scoring metrics. You've heard your FICO score, right? And, and all these lender underwriting requirements. He, he developed a process that can optimize a consumer's credit report and profile to, to say to the lenders, this guy is fundable. This lady is fundable or fundability. And so this fundability optimization he's worked out increases the amounts and the frequency of business loans and lines of credit approvals for his clients. And he founded this company, Get Fundable, getfundable.com, which you can go visit right now, Get Fundable, to deliver business loans and lines of credit approvals for his people. And it's a revolutionary technology to real estate and business entrepreneurs nationwide. And he has developed and helped thousands of borrowers, borrowers become fundable, which I love that word, and help them access over $210 million in funding in the last few years alone. Merrill has been a guest on the Entrepreneur Master Series in the past, and I'm happy to welcome him back. So Merrill, welcome to the show, my man. It is a pleasure to be here. Yes. Thank you. Hey, thank you, real Jason Duncan, because I I've talked to uh, one or two fake Jason Duncan, and we're going to be talking about imposters um, today in our, in our subject matter. So let's. Uh, I, I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled well, I'm glad here. you're here. We had such a good time with you last time. Uh, we th we said, man, we need to get you back on the show because you know for practicality and tacti tactical stuff. This uh, this stuff that you do with Get Fundable is probably at the top of the list for entrepreneurs because everybody needs access to capital. So we're going to be talking about that today. And could you tell everybody just a little bit about, I gave it in the intro a little bit about what Get Fundable is and what you do, but could you just give a sure. little flyover of what that is and a little bit of your history? Yeah, absolutely. You did mention that I co-founded Lexington Law Firm, which today is the single largest credit repair law firm in the country. The issue is, is that you cannot credit repair your way to approvals. You cannot delete a few negative items from a credit report and then all of a sudden the lender goes, congratulations, you're fundable. We're willing to give you money. And so I, when I was at Lexington, this was 1992. So I've been doing this for 30 plus years. In 92, I realized it wasn't too many years in where I'm like, we're getting deletions, but our people are saying, hey, I just got denied on my home loan. I just got denied on my auto loan. Why can't I get a credit card? And I started putting, you know, uh, putting those puzzle pieces together. <clears throat> and I was the R&D guy at Lexington anyway, just d d developing the dispute models, this and the other. And I come to my partners a, a, a while in, and I'm like, guys, hold it. We need to do something for our clients after we've gotten the low-hanging fruit off their credit profiles. What are we going to do? How are we going to make them what we now call fundable? And, and they're like, hey, that sounds like a great idea, but our business model rocks. And I'm like, we're not going to do anything to actually get them. The, they come to us because they want credit. And they're like, yeah, but we're making money hand over fist. And I'm like all right, well, I love you guys, and we're still friends to this day. I love you guys, but I got to go solve the actual problem. And so I took fundability and developed Get Fundable to as kind of the battle cry for fundability, and that has turned into a crazy and amazing journey. It just so happens that I was introduced to and now am collaborating with FICO, that three-digit credit score number that we all think is that, that we all base our 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 credit value on. And I'm actually in collaboration with them on projects to help their customers who are whose FICO customers, lenders, help lenders build better funding relationships with their deposits or depositor base. And so, so this, this, my, my journey has been one of leaving credit repair behind and going to, and meeting with FICO, meeting with lender underwriting teams to find out what 
actually makes it possible for a lender to give you money. And we now have, so I'm excited about sharing all of those little tidbits today because there we are in total control of our funding approvals. And that may sound wicked crazy to your listeners, but I'm going to show today how we're 100% in charge of our funding approvals and we can know how to do it. Well, I, I, you taught me so much last time about this, about the difference between fundability in general versus uh, just the credit score. And, and, yeah. and so the credit score is what everybody pays attention to. And most people don't understand that that score is a private, that's a private organization that does that, right? That, that they're, they're just scoring this and all of us on this side of the table, I know you're on the other side, but on this side of the table, we think completely arbitrary bull, you know what, like this is how in the world they come up with this score. I pay all my debts on time. Why is my score not 850? <laughs> so there's more to it than just a three digit score. There's a fundable, uh, fundability metric that they're kind of looking it. at. So there's Absolutely. going to be uh, some things we're going to talk about today on this show at EMS. So the first thing that I want to kind of uh, get your get you to kind of talk about is business credit imposters, like the catfish credit that can ruin <laughs> your personal credit. And these lenders send these business credit uh, offers and then it ends up screwing things up. Tell me, tell us a little bit about all what right. that is. So first of all, we're going to start at business credit in this episode, because last time we talked about personal and kind of what the effects were. Well, we're going to dial it. We're going to start at pull out, pull out the rug, right? like disabuse, do some myth busting about business credit, because most of us have a pre-2008, most entrepreneurs, most businesses, <laughs> and most organizations out there are selling a credit, business credit from a 2008 perspective, pre-2008. So what I mean by business credit imposters is that, and we affectionately call it catfish credit. You know what catfishing is on, you know, if you're on a dating site or, you know, somebody's trying to, they, they give you something that's not true just to, in order to build a relationship with you. Yeah. So there's catfishing going on for business credit. <laughs> They'll say, all kinds of things to, for you to buy a build your business credit program with them. The thing is, is think of it this way. What would our current personal credit system be like? Experian, TransUnion, Equifax, and FICO. What would our personal credit system be like if you could choose which trade lines and which accounts to report to your personal credit? Would you we only, trust? You, yeah, you'd only pick the good ones, right? We'd only pick the good ones. Would would it be a trustworthy system? No. Go like this. No, it wouldn't. And the whole point is that business credit building basically says that you can build a Dun and Bradstreet Paydex score by doing these steps. Now, these steps worked to build traditional business credit. When I say traditional, real business credit is bank loans, bank lines of credit, business bank credit cards. When I say business credit, we want the real stuff, bank lines of credit, bank loans. Well, many times you'll hear somebody and maybe some of our audience has all already kind of come up against this where they say, yeah, build your business credit and get credit lines not attached to your social security number. Well, what we hear is bank business lines not attached to my personal social security number. We think of Wells Fargo, Chase, and BB&T giving us cash credit lines to be able to go write a check and do a deal, right? That, that's what they imply. That is not the truth. Building a, a Paydex business score does not help you get bank loans, bank lines of credit, and bank credit cards. They don't use Dun & Bradstreet Paydex score to evaluate you. Experian business and Equifax business, they're going to use they're going to use those scores, but not the one where you have power over it. That builds your business credit. And there's even an ad by bless their hearts, by Dun & Bradstreet that says, build your, I mean, they're selling their own data, right? Pick the 12 best credit uh, li trade lines to report to build your credit. I'm like, 
can we not see the insanity of this? I get to pick my positive credit trade lines in order to build a score that lenders don't use. So that's why I call them ba um, uh, uh, business credit imposters. In fact, there are certain credit cards that are also in bank uh, personal. Uh, they are business credit imposters. For example, the Discover It business credit card reports to your personal profile. What does that do? You think you're being a good businesswoman or businessman, and you're charging things up in your business on your Discover It card, and it reports to your personal profile, and those balances change your uh, available credit, your utilization, and several other metrics. At, well, and if it's a new card, it lowers your average age. So you're messing with the goose that lays the golden egg, which is your personal profile. All those business transactions are harming your personal profile. So, but do they tell us that? No, they don't even say this is going to report monthly to your personal account. Another one, Spark cards, Capital One Spark cards. There's six different colors of Spark cards. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you guys deserve the truth. If you get a Spark card, it reports monthly balances and traffic to your personal profile. If you're holding balances, because as a good businessman or businesswoman, you're holding these balances, it's harming your utilization on your personal profile. That's why they are imposters. That's why it's catfish credit. Get a business credit card and we're going to report and ruin your personal profile. That's catfish credit. Now, why, why is this um, legal. I mean, does it, doesn't that sound like that's breaking <laughs> some advertising guidelines that somebody Truth and advertising, right? Okay. Because there is no fair credit reporting act for business credit. Mm. So it business credit is the wild, wild West. And only, and we all know the story of the, of the, uh, of the lone gunman who comes to town and saves the family from the bad guys. That's all we got are people like you and me who are making announcements and trying to get people to understand that there is, there's no sheriff in, in this here town. We have to police ourselves. We have to know enough to take care of our personal profile, our business credit profile, so that we're not harming our fundability. Because there is no fair credit reporting out there. Truth in advertising, as long as they disclaim the facts, and I'll give you an example here a little bit later, as long as they tell the facts, but they don't teach us the truth of what the facts mean. And we're, and I would, I would amazing what you're going to see there is on number, on number four, when we get to it. Yeah. We're going to pull the rug out on the facts, but we don't know the right questions to ask. We don't know what we don't know. And so we're getting butchered and our personal profile is, is, is getting harmed. And our personal profile is vital to our, even our business approvals. Well, let me, let me ask you a couple of specific questions. So um, let's talk, you, you brought it up down in Bradstreet and Paydex. You brought up those two things. And so I get, I get clients new, you know, newer entrepreneurs asking me, Hey, you know, I, do I need to apply for a Dunn's number? Do I need to do this? Do I need to pay them? And my response out of, from my experience has been no, because it doesn't do anything for you. They're just trying to sell a product. <laughs> and, and so you laugh, but I think you probably agree with me. What would you say just in general, all these entrepreneurs listening to this show right now, is done in Bradstreet. Does it even worth it? Should okay. they be famous? So too? what I what I tell my students and clients is yes, get a Dunn's number. No, do not build your credit profile, your business credit profile, or your Paydex score. Perfect example. A Paydex 80, uh, uh, an 80 Paydex score means you pay all your bills on time. Your business lenders are going to report to the business credit profile of uh, the, the business credit bureaus without you doing anything, anything. They want you to pay money. I mean, think of it, think of it this way. What about how trustworthy would our system, our credit system be if um, 
if Equifax scored its own data, because Dun & Bradstreet is scoring its own data and selling it. FICO is a third party, right? Even Vantage score, which is a, 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 a fake score, but even Vantage score is a third party. If you, It's illegal for a credit bureau, a data repository, to score its own data because of the conflict of interest. But over on the business side, the wild, wild west of business credit, you get to do whatever the hell you want. So <laughs> they score their own data. No bueno. This so, is not good. So don't so don't pay for the Dun & Bradstreet when they call you and want you to sign up for their prescription subscription. Don't do it. If you need a Dun's number for something, you can apply for that and you can get a Dun's number for free. Um, Correct. But now let me ask you another question on this before I go to another another kind of big topic that we're going to talk about on 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 credit cards. So you you mentioned Spark and you mentioned Citibank and you mentioned some of these others, right? So I I personally have. Uh, I am uh, an American Express Gold that I use for personal expenses, but I also have a platinum card for a business that's issued yes. for the business, but it's attached to my social security number, but it does not appear anywhere on my personal Correct. credit. Let's talk Nowhere. about that. So how Let's does how does that actually that. help me build business credit? Uh, brilliant. Okay. So there are three types of relationships that a credit instrument can have with you. What, what you've done is, uh, let's say um, you want to build your business credit. Don't do it. You want to build your business credit and uh, get a paid X score. So they're going to send you to Granger and Uline and some fuel cards that are not attached to your social security number. And that's what they're calling credit lines. That's the deceptive language that makes them catfish credit. They're calling them credit lines, but they're not. They're a credit card that allows you to buy materials from that particular store, right? But it's not attached to your social security number at all. It's only EIN. So when you hear language attached to your EIN, that's where you want to be careful because all, all real business credit is attached to your social security number. So that's the second stage. You can get these merchandise cards. You can get a $50,000 um, uh, Home Depot commercial account that doesn't have your social security number attached. It's only attached to the business, but you're not gonna get a Bank of America business credit card, credit line or loan without your social security number. So the second level is you give them, it's attached to your personal, uh, uh, you're personally responsible. So if the business doesn't pay it, you, uh, Jason Duncan have to pay it. But, and if you don't pay it, it ends up as a negative account on your personal profile. So it's not registered as a positive account on your personal profile, only if it goes negative. Does that make sense? Correct. So, th and that's where you are right now. Your American Express Platinum does not report monthly because it's in positive status. If you were to go, if it were to go into collections, it would show up as a negative collection on your personal profile, okay? And then the third level is, where they say, oh, it's business credit, as we've already discussed, but they report the monthly positive balances to your personal profile, and then it's an imposter. Then it's ruining your the positive version of your fundability. So those are the three levels. EIN only, but you're only going to get merchandise. No, what we call cash cards, right? You use same as cash, wherever Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover uh, uh, cards are, are taken. So merchandise only can be attached to your EIN and then no monthly balances, but those monthly balances, but if it goes negative, it reports and then it reports current monthly balances. And we don't call it truly business credit because it's reporting all the activity on your personal profile. So to bring that down to kind of uh, the top, the walk away point here is that if you're looking for business credit, generally speaking, based on what you're telling us, is that you're going to have to give your social security number, but their reporting should not be monthly reporting to your personal line, or your personal credit report. It should only report negatives, which is, which, and now you've got true business credit. But if any, Correct. if it's the other two, it's not technically business credit. It's not helping you. As a matter of fact, the third kind is hurting 
your personal is actually hurting you on the month to month, right? So yeah. here's our first value add for your audience. We have pre-vetted these business credit cards. So if your listeners want to go to getfundablecreditcards.com, get, uh, get fundable credit cards, plural, cards.com, there is a list of all of the pre-vetted cards, business cards that do not report to your personal profile. You're not going to find Discover It, and you're not going to find Spark <laughs> from, <laughs> from Capital One. So get fundablecreditcards.com. Get fundablecreditcards.com, and you will find your visa, you will find your American Express Platinum there because that's a great charge card. Yeah, we've been using, I've been using that since I guess 2013. So nine years and, you know, we've had, Brilliant. you know, American Express is, is not a commercial for them, but they've been, they've been, they're, they're fantastic when they're great, but boy, if they get anything up their crawl, dude, they will rock you because they don't, yeah, I don't have cool. a limit. I don't have a limit. I can spend as much as yep. I want until they decide mm, we're not going to let you spend that much this month. And then that's when it goes right. sideways. And that's happened a couple of times in the last nine years in the most inopportune times but i digress so you say that we've been lied to about what gets you real business credit is that what you mean is that is that everything yeah. you just talked about that's that's what we're talking about so let's talk about the names because you said your business name can make you unfundable and you revealed this in our last ems when you were here back i don't know how many months ago it yeah. was but that name your name and your business name alone could make you unfundable what do you mean by that that is correct. Okay, so I'm gonna pop. Uh, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Does that work for you? Yeah, go for I'm it. I'm gonna share my screen, and I'm gonna give these uh, your audience for those who are. If you are not listening, we need to listen um, <laughs> because, uh, or we need to view this because this is going to be a this is going to be a big deal. Um, these are what we call up. Uh, can you see that big? Yes. All right. So. Um, these, if you, the name of your business, if the name of your business includes one or more of these, uh, of these names, you are automatically unfundable for real business credit, business credit card, bank, business cards, bank credit lines, and bank loans, You're automatically unfundable. And here's why. Can I tell, can I tell the story, Jason, before we come back face to face? What, what's fascinating here is that um, the Secretary of States are mandated by the feds to track growth in the different sectors of our economy. So it, they have to report the different types of, 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 of new businesses that come in with a, uh, a, a new LLC or a new INC, right? A stock corporation. So when you open up a real estate investor business, you're a super proud real estate investor and you call it, let's call it, let's go back here, real estate property resources, right? Well, what happens is those names, the, the secretary of state looks up on a, a, a lookup table for who you are in their sector codes. It's called an SIC code or an NAICS code. So uh, SIC stands for Standard Industrial Classification. And it's an SIC code. I mean, the NAICS code is North American Classification System, right? In the industry Classification System, NAICS. So they, the Secretary of State, reads the name uh, in your in the name of your business or the purpose of your business in the description of what you're in business for <clears throat> and then they code it and those codings automatically get so the so bank of america city all of the lenders get downloads they buy the data from the state and when they see the code that they've assigned you don't get to see the code I don't get to see the code, but that code is then shared with lenders. Lenders then go, oh, they are unfundable. They do these business codes behind your back. And, and then the lookup tables, those, those subscriptions are then purchased by lenders, which put you in an unfundable category. To make it even worse, they then, to make it even worse, 
the business credit reporters, Dun & Bradstreet, Experian Business, and Equifax Business, all subscribe to the Secretary of State codes as well, and then publish those Secretary of State codes on your business credit reports. And when you are when you are ratted out in two ways, both by the Secretary of State and by the business credit reporters, you become a, a you become automatically unfundable in every in every possible way. There is wow. no chance. Of go back. You go back to that. Go back to the screen with all the names, because for those that are not watching, I want to I want to I'll read these names off. So if you have this this in your name, so go back one more slide. Go there back to go. the list of names. Yeah, there we so, go. So this this list, well, this list right here, I'm going to read these off. If you have a business with this, any of these words in your name, you're automatically red flag unfundable. So change the name of your business, which is harder than it should be. And, or if you're starting a business, don't put it real estate property, resources, estate, holdings, equities, credit, stocks, money, finance, investments. And that's the one that got me because I have a hard, I got a company called Dunhaven Investments and I didn't know that. So, oh, well, securities, prosperity, funding, wealth. I got a friend with the name wealth in his business, assets, capital, and savings. So those are some words. What is that? Two, four, six. That's 18 different phrases or words that you need to make sure you don't have based on what Merrill Chandler is telling us today. And he is the get fundable guy. He knows about this stuff. So, all right, cool. That's how can your name get you unfundable? That's, that's what we're talking about. Right. So, so that is what we're, that's what we're looking for in our, there we go. So, so those words rat us out. Now, the uh, the the key to, to to turning this from a negative to a positive is to separate yourself from your deals. Since 2008, I remember I said that the well, let me give a little backstory on this. What we what we don't hear much about in the Great Recession, where the more that was precipitated by the mortgage system failure, was lenders lost their shirts also on business lending, and business lending was used as a because it was full doc lending, and so they trusted the documentation of the business over. The uh, over the uh, 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 over the um, what they have now converted their underwriting systems to to monitor borrower behaviors. More on that in a minute. So they all of this documentation did not help these businesses stay in business during the Great Recession. They the, that documentation did not predict the success or failure and. Tons of people who they thought it was easy to lend money to lost their shirts. So lenders lost their shirts. So what they've done is that they stopped underwriting or the most, the easiest and cheapest money comes from what we call automatic underwriting, automatic approvals. A perfect example of this is where you have, and we'll go into greater depth here in a minute, but where you get approved in 30 or denied in 30 seconds or less when you fill out an application online you're like boom boom well no human being looked at that no underwriting manual underwriting process they're not asking you for documentation they approve you or deny you based on a series of of borrower behaviors which we'll get to in a minute but the point is that your since 2008 the underwriting game has changed and they are basing <coughs> they're basing it on uh, on on next level um ai and we and so we can get so let's cover let, let's go to the next section because that is kind of a perfect lead in about how to really get uh how, how to get real business credit all right so we've been lied to about how to get real business credit <laughs> so so what's the truth <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, a little bronchitis. Um, 
All right. So what what the lies have been is that a we need full we need to full doc. Another lie has been that um, not only does it have to be full doc, but it's based on your PLs of the business and based on your income of the business. That's no longer that's no longer the the top three considerations in deciding to loan to you. What we have what what's really happening behind the scenes is that your real real business credit, business bank credit cards, business bank credit lines, and business loans are they review your borrower behaviors. Not even your credit score. They review <laughs> your borrower behaviors. And so these borrower behaviors are what don't lie because they they review these borrower behaviors over the course of the previous 24 months in increments of three months, six months, 12 months, and 24 months. If you've been keeping a low balance on a credit card for 24 months, they can predict you're going to continue that behavior over the next 24 months, which makes you very fundable. If you continue to raise credit lines, but only use 10 to 20% of those credit lines, that is a non-risky behavior. So they're willing to raise your credit limits because 10% of 10,000 is 1,000, but 10% of 100,000 is still a low risk um, uh, economics for them. And so they'll continue to raise your credit limits if you're using these magic numbers, right? And so real business credit, you guys, comes from your personal credit borrower behaviors. That's why all of these banks hold your personal credit. They're not checking your credit score. They're checking your borrower behavior. And we'll, we'll get into um, scores here in the next section. But just remember, they're reviewing your borrower behaviors to see how you treat personal credit because in 2008, relying on business documentation was a massive fail, massive fail to the tunes of billions of dollars in losses to the banks. So, so they, they, well, let me ask you, let me ask you, because you just mentioned something when you said they're not check, they're not checking your score, they're checking your, your buyer behaviors. Why then? If they're just checking that, why do we get dinged as an inquiry on that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, great, great question. So the reason why we get an inquiry and, and a ding, to, uh, to use your term, is because if we're chasing money, they want to track our, forgive the language, they want to track our unsophistication about looking for money. If we're chasing money, they want to know it. And that's why we they lower the score, lower the score, lower the score every time we go chase it. Let me tell you a, a, a story about one of my clients. Oh, it's, uh, it's all right. Let me tell you about one of my clients. So uh, we'll cover this in greater detail uh, in, 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 in as we continue here. But they believed my uh, Lindsay and her husband believed that their scores. They had high scores, mid 800 scores. And before they came to me, they thought that these high scores meant approvals. They thought high scores equaled approvals. Not true. Never mm -hmm. has been, never will be. But that's the illusion. That's what we've been taught. That's the shy. Our scores are the shiny object that people have been, uh, that, that we've been trained to believe is important. Okay, so that we're not paying attention to what's really being measured. Well, the fascinating thing about this is that so they had 830s, 820s and 830s. So they went to one bank and got denied. So they're like, oh, it's down to eight, uh, 825. They're like, oh, that wasn't the right bank. Our scores are great. Somebody will take our 825. Ding, another seven points down. And then, oh, now we're at, uh, we're now at 817. Oh, now we're down to 812. And every time they hit it, their score went down, but nobody was approving them. And they thought it's because they weren't at the right bank. Never once until they learned what your, 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 your crew is learning right now. Never once did they question the assumption that the score doesn't matter. That's not what's being measured. 
What's being measured is their bar behaviors, which don't change. Their bar behaviors were unfundable, but their scores were high. So they just kept hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. So now when they come to me to answer your question, Jay's, they look like they're chasing money. And lenders want to know if we're not sophisticated. If And so those dings count against us because we have been we have been chasing the wrong we've been we've been believing the wrong thing and therefore we believe that our high credit scores merit an approval so we just got to find the right bank and that's never been true was scores, there is there well the scores are easy to see i mean we can all see it we can order our scores my bank now actually if i log into my bank shows my score on the screen mm -hmm. and you know i've yeah. got a great score great credit score and i pay my bills but but what you're saying is they're looking at something that we can't easily see as the consumer so that is correct how do we how do we delineate between that <laughs> fico score or the faco score or whatever you call all right it? how do yeah. we do that so let's let's take let's take a look at that first of all we just came off the section where your personal your personal credit behavior is what gets business approval. So let's let's now pull the rug out from underneath you. Um, there are FICO scores, the only true and living scores. They're the only scores used by lenders. And then there are what I call FACO scores. And a FACO score by definition is any score that is pr presented to you, but isn't used by lenders in the approval process, okay? If it's not used in the approval process, not the review process, like looking at your bank and seeing your score, that score is not used in the approval process. That score is used to tell you a general feeling of your credit profile. Like credit karma. <laughs> yeah, even, even those scores do not, um, uh, even those scores do not list your, uh, are not used in the, in the process. Now, the great the great deceiver of all deceivers in the current financial marketplace, guys. Credit Karma has 100 million subscribers, and the scores they provide are not used by lenders. Mm. Period. It is the greatest purveyor of FACO scores. In fact, so much so that the FTC just fined them $3 million for misrepresenting the value of their scores to their subscriber base. And the only thing that Credit Karma is going to do, I keep monitoring their site. This happened like three weeks ago. I keep monitoring their site. The only thing that's ever going to change is they're going to tighten up the disclaimer at the bottom of page 17 because you they don't, as long as they say these are not used by lenders, they can get away with saying anything they want because they have disclaimed the 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 veracity or the truthfulness of those scores. You guys, let me tell you about the big bait and switch that Credit Karma does. Credit Karma, you see two scores. Experian uses FICO. That's why it's not on the, that's why it's not on the Credit Karma front page is because Experian uses FICO. So you got TransUnion Equifax. You've got those two scores. If you look down there in the middle, it says Vantage 3.0. That's not FICO. So they're disclaiming the truth, but we don't know because we haven't attended um, Jason's uh, uh, trainings before. You don't know what you don't know. We don't even know how to hold the information we're being presented. But here's, here's the wicked evil part. Those scores that are right there on the front, it, right to the side, right to the right of it, you will see an offer for a credit card that says matches your score. If you click apply now and you fill out that app and hit submit, they pull a FICO score to evaluate whether or not they're going to approve you, not the scores on the front page. <laughs> Hear me? Everybody, everybody with me. They pull a real FICO score because FICO is what lenders use. Now, here's the worst part. In several independent, several independent um, studies, a group of 
Credit Karma users who also use FICO scores, by the way, write this down and we'll put this in our show notes, the uh, my, uh, the FICO reports, plural, FICO reports.com. That is where you can get your FICO scores, FICO reports.com. Once you look at those FICO scores, Credit Karma tends to be approximately 30 in the best case and 60 in the worst case points higher than FICO. 30 points to 60 points higher. So if you see a 720 on Credit Karma, your FICO score is likely, not guaranteed, but is likely to be lower or significantly lower than your Credit Karma scores. Now, here's, you ready for an insider secret? Uh, well, these are all insider secrets. Jason, you ready <laughs> for a super insider secret? Yes. Okay, so credit scores can deny you an application, just straight up deny you, okay? But credit scores are not used to approve you. So here's what happens. Let's say you're going to a bank, doesn't matter which bank, let's just say that the denial cutoff, the, the denial cutoff is 720. So if you have a 719 score, you get denied. You're not even in the game. But if you get a 720, listen carefully, it doesn't matter if you have a 720 or an 820. Your score is not used in the approval process. The score was used just to keep you in the game, keep you on the court. Then the borrower behaviors, there are 40 borrower behaviors that are used to evaluate your fundability. 40 borrower behaviors are over the course of the preceding 24 months. So depending on your borrower behaviors, they will approve you or have a second level of denial. If they approve you, you know what your FICO score is finally used for after that first threshold gets passed? Your FICO score is used for risk assessment. What kind of interest rate? Do we charge a high interest rate or a low interest rate? And do we give them 5,000 or 50,000? That is what your FICO score is used for after you've been approved by the 40 borrower behaviors that's not in charge of FICO or isn't run by FICO, but run by lender software. So we got denials based on FICO. We got approvals based on lender software and rate and term and amount of the approval are based on FICO again. So it goes FICO, lender, FICO. Everybody with me? Yeah. Everybody with me? So. We've been led to believe, focus on score, focus on score, focus on score. Well, a high score is great after you've been approved. Great. We want the highest limits and the lowest interest rate. But most of us, I have, I have hundreds and hundreds of people come to me going, the whole reason why they engage me is because I, they, they're not getting approved with a, a, an 810 credit score. They're like, what is wrong? And I'm like... You're just, you're focusing on something that the lenders don't use to approve you. And that's where we optimize. They learn how to optimize their borrower behaviors. In fact, um, these 40 borrower behaviors, can I, can we give another value add here? Can we drop yeah. another? Okay. So listeners, viewers, uh, tribe members go to get fundable behaviors, plural behaviors.com. And you'll find not just the 40 borrower behaviors, I'm giving you the pool of 150 borrower behaviors that every lender and FICO draw from to build their underwriting software. Boom. Nice. Yeah. Get I'm looking at that right behaviors. now. Behaviors.com. Yep. I'll look at that now. And you know what? You 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 said that FICO report.com. You said you said FICO reports. That doesn't. It's singular. FICO report .com is the one that's working. That goes to my FICO .com. That's what yes. you wanted earlier. Yes. But this FICO is get fundable behaviors, and we'll put all this. We'll make sure all of yeah. this. Uh, Meg and my assistants in on this. We we'll need to make sure all of these website 
these URLs get in the YouTube notes for this one. This gets pushed out on YouTube and also the show notes when it gets released as a podcast so that you can go click on this because Merrill's given us gold here and we need to make sure that we bend over and pick it up. Yeah, absolutely, man. By the shovel. For, we need a backhoe. <laughs> we need a backhoe. All right. So so those are the so those are the big plays that are going on behind our backs. Our borrow behaviors until now, our borrow behaviors were being measured behind our backs. Our uh, our score versus borrow behavior, FACO scores versus FICO scores, that there are imposter credit, uh, business credit, and that and that you're Business metrics are not the key approval factor, but your personal borrower behaviors are the key business approval. We've been, uh, yeah, we got, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, it's thick with content here. You guys, we, we have, we'll give you an opportunity to kind of, to unpack all of this, all of this. So, Ooh, any clarifying questions there well, as we continue? One of the things, one of the things that one of the things you taught me in the in the last time you were here that still when I tell people this, they don't believe me, but we do it anyway. I tell them to do it anyway. Is that one of the borrow behaviors uh that you need to pay attention to is not paying your credit card statement within or your bill within seven days of the due date before the due date, which is the weirdest thing ever. Because my, I, when I was telling my wife this after the fact, I'm like, she, cause she handles paying the bills for the household. And she goes, well, our Amex, cause we, we charge everything on Amex and then pay it off at the end of the month. That's, that's just kind of our MO. So, uh -huh. so at the end, let's say there's 10 grand that we have to pay off and the bill's due on the 13th She and it's the sixth. She's like, you want me to go ahead and do that? Like, no, <laughs> please <laughs> do not do that. It. Don't touch it. <laughs> don't do it till right? the 13th. Why? Well, I don't know why. Just got in Merrill told me not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and what's happened to your fundability since our last discussion, I got to say. Yeah, I'm buying a cabin in the mountains. I'm trying to close on that right now. <laughs> right, right. So uh, scores increased. Even uh, if we already have an 800, why not have an 850? But the 850 only matters after our borrow behaviors, like the one you're mentioning, are all dialed in, right? Then we, of course, we want an 850 because that 850 is going to give us the cheapest rates and the highest approval amounts. So if we go, so if we go do, let, let's let's kind of run down maybe two or three of these take home actions that people listening in their car or whatever, wherever they are say, like, oh, I can do this. So one is don't pay your credit card, your loan statements early. You can pay them early, but just not in the seven days prior to the due date. That's not one. The seven, yes. So uh, technically we would love for you to put it on auto pay and have them draft your account to pay it to zero on the due date. Now, what, what Jason is an advanced strategy. What Jason's talking about is like, I charge every week. I charge up uh, the previous week, Tuesday, pay it off, charge it up, pay it off, charge it up, pay it off. But the last one, I wait until the due date. So I don't pay it earlier because you want FICO and lender software. Remember the borrower behaviors that they're measuring measures your fastidiousness. They want to know, they can't measure whether or not it's three days before, five days before, nine days before. They can't measure that. What they can measure is what's due on what's due on the due date and was it paid on the due date. They can measure that all year long. So they want to know that you are pay. So if you can make a payment nine days before, that's great. But make sure there is something, $1, something that you pay off on the due date because they're measuring the fastidiousness of you as a borrower. Do you, and if it's on auto, you get uh, auto pay, you get more uh, relationship building quality with that lender you you score high remember there's fico and then there's lender software the lenders measuring you as well they're measuring how much utilization how much traffic all the things and if you build that relationship if you have an auto pay you gain mad points with that lender for having an auto pay especially if it's auto pay to zero rather than auto pay with a minimum payment you know, Meryl, I just had this happen. So it was a weird thing. So I'm going to let, I'll, I'll lift up the kimono for everybody's benefit here for just a second. So on our gold card, we charge between seven and maybe $10,000 a month, just on average, right? Just to pay everything. 
Well, we got we had one month that was sitting at like thirteen thousand, and no problem. Everything was paid off. We paid off one hundred percent. We never let Amex ever go over to the next month. Well, two months ago, I don't even know if it was two months ago, but we we were at like say nine thousand, nine thousand some change, and I went to put sixteen hundred dollars on it. I don't even think it was sixteen hundred dollars. I did have a sixteen hundred dollars charge, but there was some piddly amount. It was it wasn't a ton of money. That and and the it said the charge was denied. Now it actually went through, but I got a notification that was denied, even though it went through, which was the weird thing. Right. So I called Amex. I'm like, hey, I keep getting these text messages that you're denying charges. In fact, they're all going through. What's going on? Well, your your balance is higher than normal. So even though you have an unlimited card, we're gonna we're gonna limit this until you pay this down. So and I, there's a point to this. I want to see if I'm right about this. So I said. But it's not higher than normal. I'm, I see what I charge, and, and this is we're way below what we've ever done the highest amount. She argued with me, I didn't win. And at the end, she goes, well, If you would just make a payment today, pay this down your, your statement balance, which was like $6,200. If you pay that today, which was within seven days of the due date, by the way, and this is why I'm telling this story, <laughs> she goes, If you do that, then we will everything will go back to normal. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and I didn't use her name. And I said, because I know that if I pay it off now, it actually hurts my credit. It hurts me. And she goes, oh, please be assured, sir. We do not report this to your credit card. We're not going to report this. And and so what she was saying, and this is what I think people need to understand, is that, yeah, it ain't going to affect the score, but it does affect my fundability, right? Your relationship with American Express. Yes. Absolutely. Because we got to keep those two worlds apart and then coordinate them. It's not, they're not going to report it, right? But they are going to intern, it's called internal performance data. If this were the NBA or the WNBA, think of it as our stats at a game. They know every, re, all the rebounds, all the three pointers, all the, uh, all the, uh, the free throw lines, they know every stat. And if you're out of sync, they knock on your door and be like, Okay, player, what is going on? Because you're out of normal range. What's up, right? Trouble at home, whatever the whatever the hell. So we need to know what our performance indicators are. And just because they're tracking them, notice how tight their tracking was. I mean, that's... It's crazy. It, it was nuts and very infuriating because like I said earlier, they're great when they're great. But if they ever get something up their crawl sideways, man, they could screw yeah. you up. And it's like I had I had five days before the due date. And I told her, I said, listen, it's set for auto pay on the due date, the 13th, whatever that was. I said, we'll pay it then. She goes, well, between now and then, we may or may not approve your credit. Listen, <laughs> nothing was, and we always got our coffee at the coffee shop. It always worked. <laughs> right. The one charge for $1,600 that went through at, that later when I went to pick up, it was this thing for my motorcycle. When I went to pick it up, they were like, yeah, you still need to owe the old balance. So even their system picked it up that, hey, it got flagged, but it, it's weird. All right, so let's go to another one. What's another borrower behavior that you can recommend to the audience so we can start doing immediately that would affect our okay. fundability? This one is, this one's vital, you guys. And every one of you will be like, that makes sense. Like, what the hell? Why don't we know this sooner, right? There is a difference between utilization and traffic. Utilization is, we, we just talked about, we, we, we break it down into terms of, of relationship with your lender and reputation that gets reported to the bureaus by the lender and scored by FICO. Repu uh, reputation is what gets reported and scored. Relationship is that it, those internal metrics, right? So traffic is charge up, pay down, charge up, pay down, charge up, pay down. Traffic is how much you charge and how much you pay off. Utilization is what gets reported. Now, here's what most people don't know is that the balance at the statement close date, your statement, your billing period closes. They call it the statement close date. That's what gets reported to the bureaus by 99% of all lenders. If you want pure magic to happen on your profile to improve your reputation that's getting reported, you can charge up to 90%. But when the statement close date, three days before the statement close date, pay it down to under 10%. And let your statement close with that 10% number and then have auto pay on the due date, pay off that last 
that will radically transform your the 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 reputation that you're publishing on all your credit cards now for 99.9% .9 of all lenders that is a manual transaction because they don't want they want to report your high balances your high traffic right they want to report that stuff i'm telling you the insider secret is what gets reported is what your statement closes with. So everybody pay that down under 10% three days before the statement close day so that it reports and you have a less than 10% um, reporting balance, you are sweet sauce golden. So 10% of what? 10% of the, the limit. The limit. The 10 so if it's Amex, the there is no limit. Like, what do you do with that? So you're going to have to go, you're going to have to go with 10% of your average traffic. Okay. So a grand. So say, so say, yeah. say a thousand dollars. And that's why, that's why, um, uh, 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 charge cards like your Amex that don't have a limit, they are less valuable credit instruments than ones that do have a limit because the limit gives the more metrics for the lender to, to, to do, to evaluate you. Okay. So we can't, it's an, it's a high value card, right? Uh, by the way, high value is anything that's a limit over 10,000 or usage over 10,000. And it's older than two years and reports to all three bureaus. So a high, since it's a high value card, we can't do anything but manage it well. So, so you would look at, like you said, $10,000, you would say $1,000 by the close of the statement. So the statement close date is not the due date. Correct. That's so, the beginning of your, the statement close date is the beginning of your grace period, usually 15, 25, 30 days. And then later is the due date where you get to carry that 10% and then pay it to zero. There's no interest. Nice. Okay. What about something else? You got any, let's go one more. You got one more <laughs> yeah, recommended. Got, action. All right. I have over a hundred of these. All right. So let's go to, uh, let's go to um, utilization. Let me break down utilization for you. There is a common myth out there that utilization, remember, is what gets reported at that statement close date. So we're going to leverage off of what we just talked about, getting it that down to 10%. But the next, the, you never want to go over 95% utilization, meaning uh, your balance at the close of statement is more than 95% because interest when the, when the statement closes and you're higher than 95%, the interest that's charged will likely take you over limit over limit is second worst to 30 days late in terms of lenders. So never go over 95%. If you're charging it up because, Oh, I know some of us, I, I had to scramble uh, before I knew what I was doing. There were times in my life where I learned all this on my own crash test dummy, right? I, I've gotten the hell beat out of me because learning all this stuff. So you don't have to, but the bottom line is never go over 95% because when they tack on the interest at the statement close date, you'll still be under 100% uh, utilization and you won't get the over limit charges and you won't get the over limit derogative negative indicators. Next, there is no difference between a 70% balance and a 40% balance. Anything over 40%, you're in the risk department. They're watching you with 10 times more negative, uh, negative uh, uh, borrower behaviors than at 39%. So don't go over 40%. Over 40% uh, utilization is bad. Yeah, 40% utilization. The 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 misnomer, a lot of people say that there is, you know, hey, if you're under 30%, you're okay. No, 30% just means that if you're highly fundable in other areas, they might consider a credit limit increase. But 30% is still bad. 30% is still bad. You want to be in that under 10%. And then we go back to the last point we made. Um, under 10% at the statement close, if your statement closes at less than 10% of the limit, or in case of charge cards, 10% of your common usage, then you're that's way more fundable 
than any of the others. So 30% is not good, you guys. Every, the huge myths out there saying, as long as you're under 30%, you're fine. No, 10% is what's going to get you more value from your lenders. Interesting. Very, very interesting. So we've got... Um... We've got a personal credit card that we have. It's kind of like the emergency card that's really not for emergencies, just sitting back there. The only thing we put on every month is a storage fee for our RV, and it's less mm -hmm. than 100 bucks. And so that's the only thing. So it's charged. We paid off. It's charged. We paid off. Am, am I doing the right thing with that? And it's like um, a fifty. Yes, I think I like a $15,000 limit or something like that. Yeah. You, they If there's a credit crunch, they may lower your limit because you're not charging enough on it. So you're not doing anything wrong. You're just not optimizing the use of that card so you may want to consider putting on on that card your netflix and your you know just uh, several other automatic payment type things to get the numbers up a little higher um i segregate my cards by type of purchase um so that i have traffic if you if it's open you want traffic on it or they will lower the limit if if we're in a credit crunch or they will sell your, they'll lower your limit and sell that available credit to somebody else who mm -hmm. is going to use it. Yeah, we had, we had a credit card one time with a credit union that we just never used. It was just kind of sitting there and they closed that sucker and we were mad. We're like, hey, you didn't even tell us. They just closed it. Yep. They just closed yeah, it. Because so. here's what, think of it this way. They have, they, they ha have only so much credit that they can lend. It's because it's based on their reserves, 10 times their reserves. So if somebody's not using a credit limit, they're going to prove somebody else over here who's going to use it because they are looking for transaction fees, yeah. swipe fees. Those swipe fees are the second after our second highest in revenue to interest. So if you're not swiping, they want to give it to somebody who is swiping. So I've got a uh, an interesting question to ask you about credit card companies just in general, but I'm going to hold that. So don't let me forget. But by now I want to go back to credit repair because this is your whole business kind of started with Lexington Law Firm, credit yeah. repair. And knowing, knowing the, who you are, credit repair has to be a legitimate thing. But what would you do? What would you do for a person? Let's say it's a young person went out, and got their first credit card, and there's a three hundred dollar limit at a bank or something, and they ran it all the way up and then forgot to pay it, didn't pay it. You know, they're 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 young and dumb. They don't understand yet. They don't understand. They just forgot, didn't do what they were supposed to do, and of course, it's done. The deal is done. Right. How do they come back from that? Is there a quick way through sure. that? We're not talking about a ten thousand dollar credit card they didn't pay off. We're talking about a three hundred dollar credit card. Is yeah. it any different? Well, the first thing is don't make the same mistake twice. So I'd get educated. We have a borrower education thing we'll be talking about, but get, find out how this game is played. It's not hard. There is nothing that I have said that it's hard. You just got to know, right? So, and you got to practice. A free throw is not hard. You just got to practice to get good. So, if you, so for this individual, the idea would be to, pay it, even though they charged it off, to maintain the relationship with the bank, I would have them pay it, and then ask the customer service rep, what can I do to rebuild my relationship with you? They might offer a, a secured card, or they might recommend opening up a checking account, because it is easier to get credit from a lender when you prove to them you know how to manage your own money. So here, so I would have them open up a checking account to run so that they can see how money, how you treat your own money. Now, I'm going to tell everybody this one may be the most powerful to do for any of your people. First of all, one of the great passive aggressive deceptions that lenders do is offer you a, a, a check guarantee account or card to backstop your checking account, right? And an over limit card, right? A, a, an insufficient fund. So you don't bounce checks, right? That is actually a trap because if you feel like you're not going to pay $35 in bounce check fees, Sometimes we will go into zero and that's a borrower behavior that they measure to see how we treat our own money. So it is deceptive 
it's brilliant on their part <laughs> notice most people when they go get a, an account they're like hey we're gonna we're just gonna attach a 500 dollar um uh, a 500 uh um uh, insufficient funds account there right and so um and so that um your overdraft account that overdraft account is literally giving you an opportunity to show them how you handle money poorly. <laughs> so the way to stop this, guys, the way to stop this is close that overdraft account because it's a it's a low value junk account when it comes to sophistication. Then call every single credit card and say, please reject any transaction that takes me through zero, reject it. It is better that you scramble at dinner or scramble at the gas pump if your transaction is going to go through zero because you do not want to send the message to the lender who's tracking it. I haven't got money in my checking account. Reject the transaction because to the best of our knowledge, when you reject the transaction, their software is not covering it because everybody does overdraft accounts. So they're just measuring how many times you tap into this 500 bucks, right? I used to live for my overdraft. When I'd get my paycheck, I'd pay it to zero. And then I'd, I mean, I've, I've done it all you guys. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not the, uh, the uh, fundability maven because I just, you know, I just, I read a book that didn't exist. I had to write it. <laughs> so, so the point is, is that cut that off, reject any transaction that punches through zero, close your overdraft account, and you will already be on your way to managing your own money. So to the answer to your question, that's what I would teach this young person who's got 300 bucks of failed credit. I would build the relationship, pay that off, and then build the relationship again, prove up my internal performance data so that they can re-give me a secured or even a low value and then show that I can, that I can, um, that I'm, I, I'm a good investment. Now, you can do disputes while well, our program even offers uh, templates for that. You can do disputes, but what I know from my, all my years of 30 years of, of being in this credit space is that credit repair is not trustworthy if you're depending on it to remove all your negative items from all three bureaus. Likely not going to happen. So that means you you even if you get it off of one or two, you're not going to get it. You may not get it off of all three. And if that means somebody still ratting you out for having this $300 card or whatever the level of complexity, bankruptcies, charge-offs, foreclosures, or, or repos, all of that stuff. It's worth going through several rounds of disputes, but do not bank on it as your, uh, as your end game. Because as I learned at Lexington, you cannot repair your way to fundability. You cannot repair your way to being in good graces with a lender. You've got to build a borrower behavior set that a lender will trust. So my curious question for you is, with all of your knowledge of how credit works, is there uh, is there a uh, Merrill Chandler credit card on the <laughs> on the horizon? Are you going to start a credit card company because you know how this thing works? You know how the game yeah. is played? So what we're doing right now is we're transforming our, we have a training, right? That is, that's available to all your listeners. Um, and at, uh, and our training teaches you the process. We're in the, we're also building a, a software application that allows you to create fundability on your phone or on your desktop. And um, when that scales, then we will be buying a bank which offers credit cards and loans and lines of credit. But at this point, no, there is not a Merrill Chandler credit card um, available because if there were, it would be a tier four and I wouldn't recommend it to you instead of a <laughs> tier one. <laughs> so you're too far down the totem pole. Well, Merrill, yeah. this is a, this is great information. And I think people need to look up all the stuff that you talked about today, the myfico.com, the getfundablebehaviors.com, getfundablecreditcards.com. We're going to put all these in the show notes. 
but is there something special that you want to offer the listeners today yeah. to get in touch with you and how they could learn more about this? Uh, absolutely. So uh, what we're looking at, you guys, is we have the ability to um, to provide a low cost, especially since I mean, we've been I've been I've known uh, Jason here forever, but we have a we have a, a, a low cost training that is think of it as the collected works of Merrill Chandler. It is everything that I know about. Uh, about personal and business credit in a training, easy to execute, easy to implement uh, uh, process. And I'm going to drop that in there, uh, Jason, if you want to just. Um, yeah, Megan can put it in there. Megan's got, yeah, there, Megan's got it. There's your, there's oh, yes, the link. Um, and and Megan, you can copy that and put it in show notes. But this link takes you to our business funding master course, and it, it's normally three uh, three thousand nine hundred ninety seven dollars. And for Jason's crew, um, it's four ninety seven plus twenty nine a month, and cancel at any time. Now the twenty nine a month is amazing because you have access to me personally in our group coaching for twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We gather as a tribe and we all answer personally your questions about fundability and about your movement through the fundability process. Um, it is, we have been just go to follow that link and literally just read the reviews. Don't even believe a damn word I say or even what Jason says. Um, just read the reviews because these are real estate investors and business entrepreneurs who sat in a chair just like you and said, WTF, what is he talking about? This is crazy talk. And then they they went through the course and minds blown and, and approvals galore. So that's the offer we have is the, is the business funding master course. All right. Well, thank you, Merrill. That's that's fantastic. I want to leave you with the last word. Is there anything else about credit that you want to leave us with today before we close out and I'll go through my show notes at the end? Okay. Um, personal and business credit is a minefield. You guys are literally waking up and going, I'm in a freaking minefield. I highly suggest that you find a guide out of the minefield. If that is something that is speaking to you, if this feels uh, like it, it's not complex, but it there the landmines are all around us and we don't know where they are. We've given you a, a dozen of the insider secrets that are already going to be able to transform your 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 fundability. But there are hundreds of these and we need to know what they are. And so my last words would be just if not me, I'm, well, I'm the only guy who knows this stuff, but if not me, somebody, but find a guide to get out of the, out of the minefield. Yeah. Good advice. I mean, that's the same advice for all aspects of life. If you're trying to figure something out, you need a guide, you need a mentor, you need someone to take you there. Yeah. So Merrill, it's always a pleasure chat chatting with you. You always blow my mind so with this fun. stuff that should not be <laughs> This should not That's be secret. This should not be secret. We should know this stuff. This should know this. So thank you for being here. Everybody reach out to Merrill Chandler at Get Fundable. Thank you, Merrill, for being here. I want to go over some show notes. So I'll let you leave the chat room or leave the room while I Very finish good. up some things that we're going to talk about today. So if you like this value uh, that you got today with Merrill on this show and you want to have more where this came from, then I invite you to join the TRJD coaching family to get access to this type of high quality coaching on a regular basis. I mean, how much is knowing when you could exit your business worth you, for example? I mean, that's one of the things that I do and I work with people on a regular basis. You could take the exit readiness assessment at amireadytoexit.com. It's completely free to get a free report on how close you are to exiting the daily operations of your business. That's what I do every day to work with entrepreneurs who are stuck in the weeds of running day-to-day -day operations. So if you're interested in joining the TRJD coaching family, all you got to do is go take that free assessment at amireadytoexit. Dot com. Now, you also want to make sure that you register for the next EMS live webinar. It's going to be on October the 11th at 3.30 p.m. Central Time. The topic is learn to make millions with short-term rentals. 
And the person who's teaching it has made billions with short-term rentals. My guest expert on the next EMS is going to be none other than Avery Carl. She's the founder of the Short-Term Shop. She's an author, hosts her own uh, podcast. She's done some amazing things in the real estate market, specifically around short-term rentals. And I'm closing, uh, I think Friday, this Friday, with her organization on my first ever short-term rental purchase. And I can tell you, it's been fantastic. So we're going to drop the registration link into the chat right now. So the registration link is going to be dropped in the chat right now. So if you're here live and you want to register, go to that link in the chat. If you are listening to this later and you don't have you don't have access to this, you're not visually seeing this, then you can go to uh, just therealjasonduncan.com slash EMS. And you can register for the any of them that we got coming up. We do these every two weeks. So I am the real Jason Duncan, and I want to thank you for being a part of this EMS today. Merrill was great, wasn't he? He was fantastic. It was good to see him. Always good catching up with him. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time on the next EMS. <laughs>